Welcome back to the Saunders Society podcast. Today I'm joined by Shauna. Thanks so much for joining me. Thanks for having me. Shauna is a health and fitness coach and founder of a women's activewear brand, Miko Collective. On this episode, Shauna will be sharing her journey and the valuable lessons she's learned along the way as she built her brand from the ground up. Before I ask you some questions, I did want to go into, I guess, how I found you. Um, yeah. Something that went in my mind, sleepless nights, because all I could hear in my head was, if you're new here, my name is Shauna. I own an activewear <laughs> brand called Miko Collective. We make stunning <laughs> neutral activewear sets in Vancouver, wow. BC. So the reason I bring that up is, although the brand's not for me, it's a, it's a women's brand essentially, but the power of social media, which I do want to get into later, I just thought it was amazing how that was kind of the connection um, that, that started this off. But for people that don't know you, let's start by giving them a bit of understanding, a bit of a background into, into you and, and where you grew up. Amazing. Thanks for having me. Um, yeah, a background of myself. I grew up in Vancouver, BC, well, in a smaller town, not really that small, but it's called Langley in um, outside of Vancouver in Canada. Um, yeah, I grew up there. I'm an only child. I had a very athletic upbringing. I was a swimmer growing up. And that's kind of kind of my story from the beginning. So swimming, you talk about you were a national swimmer, I believe. I was. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I was a butterflyer from when I was like 12. I was like Olympic trial level. So I swam from when I was six to 18. How did you get into that? Is that something that you did through kind of childhood through school that you got into that? Was it something you fell into? Yeah, swimming was never through school. Like our school systems don't just because we're it's colder climate. We don't have that, I would say, through there. But I don't know. My parents just put me in swimming. I honestly can't even remember as far back. I know my dad was always like very, very the one kind of like driving me behind it. But I just remember like being like seven, eight years old, 545, always at practice from when I was like literally seven, eight, nine years old. Were you one of those people that like absolutely gave it their all? Was that like your whole life during that period when you were younger? Yeah, for sure. Like, I feel like I never really had that like fun child upbringing, if that makes sense. I feel like I kind of skipped that, but it was, it's a good and a bad thing, obviously, because it keeps you out of trouble. But from when I was, yeah, I remember from when I was literally eight years old to 18, like I trained nine times a week. Um, and it was one of those things where like before school, Monday, after school, Monday, like Tuesday night, Wednesday morning, Thursday morning, Thursday night, like doubles even. So when it came to my kind of like childhood, not that I didn't have one, but it really revolved around swimming from as far back as I can remember. So pretty intense training uh, when it comes when it comes to that kind of exercise, right? Especially if you're doing it at Olympic level, you've got to put a lot into that. Yeah, absolutely. I don't even feel like I, I don't even remember if I had a choice. Like I remember loving it when I was a lot younger and even like I was a butterflyer and I remember like a lot of times you practice doing freestyle, like front crawl and I would like beg my coaches to do butterfly for like the whole practice. Like I was like a psychotic child when it came to just like being driven um, in that sense. But yeah, yeah, it was my whole life from as far back as I remember. What caused you to stop or quit? What caused that? I got an, um, an injury, like a rotator cuff injury. Obviously as a butterflyer, you're like constantly moving your shoulder that way. And I got an injury and I think it just kind of became more of a, like at first it was a passion and I obviously loved it. But when I got injured, I started to realize that, you know, I mean, first off there's swimming, unfortunately, especially yes, when you get to the Olympic level, like there's some opportunity for some endorsements, but most Olympic Olympic swimmers still would have to have a second job. Like it can't be, it's not going to be like a full-time career, if that makes sense. And then especially on the women's side. Um, so I think I just realized that when I was kind of like 16, 17, you know, all my friends were doing fun things and I was training nine times a week. So I didn't really get that fun, you know, teenage, like later teen lifestyle. And then it just became more of a job, if that makes sense. But I didn't really see that like long term. So I kind of had the option when I was 18 to go and to a university and do like on a scholarship or quit. And I decided to quit. It just, yeah, I just, it didn't, it, it wasn't a love anymore. And it just kind of felt like more of a chore. And so I just decided that it was time. When, when you quit, obviously you probably loved it at the time and then you started not. What did, what did it feel like obviously stopping something like that? And then you going through a transition. Yeah, I was actually in grade 12. So I think there was kind of like both. I think it didn't hit me till maybe like after high school, because I think that there was a little bit of a relief there being able to actually go and enjoy. And, you know, when you're grade 12, we graduate, right? We finish high school. And so I think I got to experience a lot of those fun things um, that I hadn't of in the, in the past. And so 
Um, I think there was a little bit of relief, but then obviously there was definitely like an identity crisis, a little bit of not really knowing, you know, what my, what fulfilled me, like what my passions were, but I still feel like I was a little bit, not like young esque, like 18. So I still was kind of finding myself in general. Um, so I feel like it didn't maybe hold me to like back too much, but I think I just wasn't really sure like where I wanted myself to go, if that made sense. Like, I feel like my parents put so much pressure on me in terms of it going, you going to university and it being like that long-term thing that I think that it more felt like I was like disappointing, like my, my dad and like my parents, if that makes sense. Um, because I think for myself, I had maybe mourned it like a few years earlier when I kind of started with the injury. For sure. Did you kind of feel that pressure just from your family? Did you have an internal pressure that you felt like you needed something? Cause you talked about an identity crisis. Did you feel yeah. like you need something or did you also replace it after you quit? Yeah, I feel like I, I don't know. I feel like something like growing up that I, I felt like maybe, you know, like it was a huge thing for my dad was that like, he was so like, it's almost like he got fulfillment out of like my success. And so I kind of carried that shoulder, like that, that on my shoulders where I felt like I had to be successful in order to like have his love, et cetera. Um, and so I think that in terms of identity, I just didn't really know afterwards, like what fulfilled me, like what I wanted. And, you know, it was this, this big thing, even I, I remember vividly, it, it's kind of funny, but I was dating this guy and like dating, I was 18, not really, but you know, he actually <laughs> made a comment like that, you know, he, he wasn't really sure about me because I, um, something about like swimming and how, if I wasn't an athlete and I was going to quit kind of thing, I think we think when we're like in our late teens or when we have like an athletic background that if we quit, we're going to be a failure when, um, we, we don't realize that there's like phases in our life and that doesn't define us forever. And so I feel like that kind of was something that I had to deal with was really figuring out, okay, like what makes me worthy inside and me competing and like the results that I get out of swimming, like doesn't define my worth. And so I think that's kind of something that I really had to deal with. Um, but I really struggled after, honestly, because I got out of, of swimming and it's something that you, you're training nine times a week. Like it consumes you. And now you're like, okay, what are my hobbies? Like, what do I love, um, outside of that? And then the other thing is for me was, you know, you being an athlete growing up and exercising so much, you don't really think too much about what you're eating. Like you're training nine times a week. And so after that, you know, I like, I gained probably like 20, 25, 30 pounds after, you know, you got out of high school, you start drinking, you become legal. And then I wasn't exercising as much. I didn't really, I didn't know exercise other than swimming really. Um, and that was just so engraved in my lifestyle. It didn't really feel like, it didn't really feel like now, if you like go to the gym, I have to go do that workout. It was just something that I did, if that makes sense. It was like almost like a job. Um, so it was really just like kind of getting out of that and finding myself, dealing with the kind of like weight gain and having to like really reteach myself, um, like what, what an active lifestyle was, um, was kind of like one of the biggest struggles I would say afterwards. And obviously gaining weight, that probably was quite a shock. If you'd been in such a physical activity for, for a long period of time, did you instantly find something that would need to fulfill that? Was it just a case of going to the gym or did you find something else during that period? Yeah, I think I really struggled with just like confidence after and feeling like I said, like my sense of worth was attached to swimming and my results there. So I didn't really didn't really know like what made me happy. And so, um, you know, I started drinking a lot and going out, you know, you're 19, it's natural, you're growing up. Um, but when I realized that, you know, like I was just, I became really unhappy because obviously gaining weight, I just really lacked self-confidence. And I'm sure that had something to do with obviously the weight gain, but also, you know, putting your self-worth in, in the sport. Um, I actually ended up finding like a personal trainer and her name was Telsey and she, I just booked a couple sessions with her and I was just so inspired by her. She actually did bodybuilding shows and I did one personal training session with her and I was just like in, and after that, you know, like I, I really lacked a lot of knowledge. And so she really taught me a lot about like just lifting and how your body can change from that and gaining healthy habits. Um, and then from there, um, that's kind of where it all spiraled into like my actual fitness journey. Interesting. So you did a, you actually completed a bodybuilding show. What did that obviously not everyone goes into bodybuilding. It's quite intense. You know, it really is something that you have to monitor, um, I guess your eating and your fitness levels, but what did it feel like going into something like that? Cause that is a pretty intense thing to do. Not 
everyone's cut out for it. I personally wouldn't do a bodybuilding show, but what was that like? Yeah, I think like it's it just like shows like what an extreme personality I maybe I have is that like, you know, with swimming, it was like all in or nothing. Right. And so when I realized um, when I found bodybuilding, you know, for, for females, obviously, it's not like as much in terms of like gaining muscle. I did the bikini section, which um, you get really lean. And honestly, I loved it because it gave me like really something to focus on. It was kind of a double edged sword, I would say, in terms of my fitness journey, because I gained so much knowledge through it. Like I could, I would say I gained a lot of confidence because I obviously accomplished something, which is great. But on the other side of things, um, it, it, it put me in a really, really, really bad spot because I gained, I go, I gained like insane restrictive eating habits. Um, the coach that I had at the time was extremely bro science. So if you're not familiar, bro science would be like chicken, rice, oiled, like no oils, et cetera, like very, very health, health. Whereas like flexible dieting now would be like, you know, you can incorporate some fun foods. Um, so my coach at the time was extremely bro science. So she, she really ingrained these habits in my brain and mindsets around food that honestly put me like borderline eating disorder. Because when I did the bodybuilding show, like it's almost like I came out of swimming with not knowing my, my worth. Right. And then I did this bodybuilding show and it kind of just put another pressure on myself, if that made sense to get to the super lean state. And if, if, if you're not familiar with bodybuilding, especially with bikini for females, you get really, really lean. And for a female to be like, you know, six, seven, 8% body fat, like a lot of times you're losing your menstrual cycle. It's extremely unsustainable, but I think that I gained, I, I got to this really lean state in my body that I had never been at. And no one really talks to you about like the mental state that you, you get there. So you now have this set point of what you think is realistic and what you feel you felt your best at right and so coming out of that obviously that's not sustainable and so I almost came like back into this exact same position almost that I was with swimming it was like so extreme you know you quit and then got into bodybuilding so extreme and then afterwards I gained a ton of weight back because I just had no concept of balance it was either like I was all in all on or I was like binge eating because I would cut every single food out that I obviously enjoy so it was a good experience in terms of gaining a ton of knowledge around your food and what to eat. And that knowledge like is, is it's like, you can't put a price tag on it for myself. Like I have it to this day, but on the flip side, like it also had a really negative um, result in terms of like still like body image issues that I still deal with. And then just like creating a really restrictive um, mindset around food. You talk about like the body issues that you still deal with. Let's go into that a little bit. What what does that look like for you personally? And how do you kind of, I guess you've turned your mindset into a different way now from bodybuilding and realizing that that's not sustainable. What did that make you realize and how has that helped you moving forward? Um, it's honestly like an ongoing cycle and I've gotten a hundred times better um, in, in the last like few years, but I feel like it's something that you never have, never stop dealing with. And I think in society, like, especially, I mean, men as well, but women have this wild pressure, especially with social media to look a certain way. And I am just so hard on myself in terms of my body. And, um, it's just something that I think really stemmed from the initial bodybuilding show. And you get to that really lean point and you kind of think that anything other than that isn't good or worthy. Um, and then social media on top of that. Um, so I think like to now I've done a ton of work, you know, like I've even gone to therapy and and I have to constantly work on my self-talk and the things that I'm saying to myself and all these different things. Um, but I think that it's something that never goes away. And I think that a lot of times we're really hard on ourselves, especially, I mean, my clients have said this, like just that it's not like a linear journey. And sometimes you're going to have bad days. Sometimes you're going to have good days and just figuring out like how to combat that. Um, and not comparing yourself to others is really helped me. Um, but like I said, it's just something that I think that you just, you have to keep working at and, um, it gets better every single day, if that makes sense. Yeah, I think I, for sure. I think everyone struggles with thinking that, you know, you, you'll just do these things where it's a bodybuilding show and then you're all set. And obviously it's, it's a roller coaster ride, right? Especially the mental that can be some of the challenging parts of, of fitness in, in general, but I guess through that journey, you obviously realized that you could teach women the things that you've learned through, whether that was the therapy, doing the bodybuilding, the foods that you've learned about as well. Can you share kind of the dynamic of that business first of kind of what you do on, on that side of work? 
Yeah. So with my bodybuilding show or afterwards, I mean, this is like the thing. There's always a blessing in disguise behind everything. And I think that after my bodybuilding show, I really realized that I had this extremely restrictive mindset around food. And I felt like I could had to eat chicken and broccoli. And if I didn't eat that, I failed and I would go into these binge modes. So like I even remember one time being in my, I lived with my mom at the time and I was doing my show and I was allowed to have, you know, like a little bit of fats, if that makes sense. But I had these like honey roasted peanuts. And I remember literally going into my room and like hiding from my mom who would not have cared at all. Um, But I just, I literally had this like mindset that if I didn't stick to the plan 110% and have the exact foods that were on the list, then I failed. And then I would go into this binge mode. And I think a lot of people do this now because we think that we have to have these like super restrictive or we fail. And so after that, I really had to work on that and figure out like how I could get away from that all or nothing mindset. And what I realized was so many people struggle with this. I realized that there's so many fad diets and yo-yo diets and, you know, the statistics are that like, I think it's like 80% of people that lose 20 pounds, gain it back within three years or something like that. Right. And so I realized that there's so many fitness plans and there's so many diets you can do and there's so many workout plans, but nobody teaches you or it's a lot less that teach you the mindset behind how you can stay consistent and have balance in your life. Cause at the end of the day, like if you're somebody who loves bread and you cut it out, like you're going to start eating it again at some point. So why don't you figure out how to have a little bit, right? So with that, I said, you know what, like I was able to gain balance in my life. And so I realized that I wanted to start teaching women how they could do the same thing. And so that's when it blossomed. I was actually in university for exercise science and, um, I was like, I really want to teach women how I got to where I am. Like, how did I get from this point where I was super restrictive, had these binge eating tendencies, like had almost borderline eating disorder to now having balance where, you know, I I love the way that I look. I love my body, but I also enjoy myself. Like I go, I eat healthy 80% of the time. And I also like going out for a cocktail. Like I like going and having candy sometimes. Like, do you know what I mean? Like I like going out for a, a dinner with my friends. Like I enjoy that. So how can I do both? And so I started my health coaching business um, about three years ago, and I now teach women how they can do the same thing. Awesome. I think sustainability is the hardest part of fitness for anyone, even guys too, right? It's that mindset that you're totally, you have to be on all the time and being able to maintain that. If you go on vacation, for example, it makes it a lot harder. You can't stick to that meal plan. And I think at our age, when, you, when you're younger, you, you are all or nothing. And that becomes very, very difficult. And eventually you start to realize that. So I'm glad obviously, you you know, you are definitely helping other people. And really, you are very relatable because you've been there. You went through your sport, you did bodybuilding, you then gained weight and you've, you've brought it back, right? So you've got a really relatable story. I want to shift a little bit into relationships. So as we know, the, the worst things in life can lead um, to the best things. Um, and I know you've kind of publicly shared this story as well, um, because it's led to starting your brand, which we'll get into, but can you kind of share me, share with me that story again, kind of becoming engaged and how that life turned kind of upside down there? Yeah. Um, yeah. So I, I share this story because I think it's so, it was such a pivotal moment for my journey. Um, and I think that like we have ups and downs in life and there's never, again, it's just like never linear. And so three years ago, I was engaged. I was supposed to get married. Um, I had this like life that I thought was going X and I ended up finding that, finding out that my fiance had been cheating on me for a year and a half. Um, and so everything really just like came tumbling down over my head. And, um, again, I ended up in the spot where I, you know, I thought something was going to go a certain way and I, I had to like, truly, I, I hit like rock bottom and, Um, I was in probably one of the worst states of my entire life. I was like borderline depressed. I, I, it was, it was, I was really bad. Um, but from that, like it really, really pushed me to doing therapy, like figuring out again, like what made me happy. Like I realized that things could change so fast. So I started doing therapy. I started really focusing on like my self-worth and like what made me happy, Um, and I got to a spot where I was like the most confident in my entire life. Like I have this tattoo on my wrist of like, uh, um, oh my gosh, uh, 
a butterfly because I honestly feel like it made me flourish. Like if that didn't happen to me and everyone always says, so, oh my gosh, I'm so sorry that happened. But truly like it was the best thing that ever could have happened to me because I don't even think I realized like the little things that I was settling for in life until I was challenged to lose it all and then be like, okay, what do you actually want? Um, so I really just like used that negative situation and that situation in my life to drive me to like be good on my own and be figure out what I really wanted. And through that, I, um, I decided to start an activewear brand. So that's kind of like the next part of my journey. Yeah, for sure. We'll, we'll definitely get into that. You talked about obviously therapy, but how did you kind of go around the process of turning your life around into a positive, right? You're obviously, you hit rock bottom. You, you shared with me, there were moments where you truly didn't want to live. Um, you did obviously therapy and self growth. Can you share kind of the journey for people that may be in that situation? What did you do? Did it take you some time after that relationship essentially ended to really kind of gain yourself together? And, and what did you do there? What did you put in process? Yeah. I think that when it comes to relationships and especially when it comes to cheating, like your friends and anyone around you will like have all the advice in the world, like leave him, do this, do that. You know what I mean? Um, I actually stayed for a little bit and we actually did a lot of therapy together. And I think it was just, I mean, in the beginning, I think it was really just like listening to myself, my gut and like taking it slow. I think that not putting a pressure on um, like you need to be healed within a couple weeks. Like you need to break up now and just like really listening to myself and like my intuition, because I think that's something that I like hadn't done in the past. And, um, a lot of times we like rush into making decisions. And so I really just like slowed down and started reflecting a lot on like how I was feeling, what made me feel good, what didn't. So, I mean, therapy was a really big one. Um, spending time with friends and people that made me feel good about myself was really, really important. Um, obviously like, I know I was into fitness, but I feel like I, I maybe lost myself a little bit in that relationship. Like he was not into fitness whatsoever. And so after that, you know, I kind of got just back into fitness and like what felt good there. Um, and honestly like journaling, um, was really important. And again, just like making lists of things that made me feel good and, and reflecting that way were really helpful for me. Awesome. Ultimately, obviously, Miko Collective started from this. So that's the positive that obviously came out of it. Um, but I want to know, would, do you think you would have started that brand while you were in that relationship? Or did it kind of come up after? Was it something you always thought about, but you didn't have, maybe you lacked the self-confidence because you were in that relationship that where cheating was going on? Or was it something that after that you needed to find something? Yeah, I think one of the things about relationships is that a lot of times we don't realize like what we're even like settling for when we're in them. Um, and I think one of the things that I didn't really realize was like how the other person kind of like wants you to play small. And this really just goes into like play when it comes to like anyone you're surrounding yourself with, not even your relationship, but just, um, I started surrounding myself with people who truly like, were just like, abundance mindset, if that makes sense. So I think there's mm -hmm. like two components. I think I lacked self-confidence in the fact that when I was in that relationship and self-worth, I would not have started the company because of that. Um, but I also think like the influence around you, that was another component of, um, like a bit of a scarcity mindset that I gained more of an abundance mindset because of the, you know, new people and new groups that I was, I was surrounding myself with afterwards. Um, and then the other thing was just that situation happening made me realize that things can change so fast. And so often we have these goals that we want to accomplish or these things and don't get like starting a brand. I had so many people that were like, really like that's such a saturated industry. Like, are you sure you want to do that? Mm -hmm. And like, well, what's your differentiator? Like, how are you different? Like all these things that almost like make you want to play down and not start. And so many of us have these little inklings of things that we want to do right? Like so many of us are like, Oh, like it, what if I could do that? Or, Oh, you're so lucky that you have that. It's like, no, no, no. All of us are capable of doing this. And so I think that in that situation, obviously I gained confidence and self-worth, but I also realized that my life looked a certain way. And within a week, it was completely shifted, completely different. So if that can happen in, in any situation that you're in, so maybe you're in the most secure relationship, you're in the most secure job, whatever that looks like, that can change in a week. So why don't you actually just go for, I mean, these are the things that I feel like for myself was, why don't you just go for it? Just do it. 
Like the worst case scenario is that you can fail. But guess what? Like I said to myself, you just had the worst case scenario happen to you. And guess what? You're fine. So even if I start the business or I start the project or whatever that is, even if I fail, I'll be fine and I'll have learned from it and something good will happen. So that's kind of like the mindset that I gained from that situation. Um, so no, I don't think I would have started the business before. Interesting. You obviously built self-confidence and, and you ultimately, you know, you did start the business. I actually heard you say before, I think it was a TikTok that you're treating new friendships like dating. Um, so allowing to risk to push yourself to gain new connections. Do you think your kind of mindset has been built to say yes more easily? And, and how have you managed to switch that mindset? Yeah. Um, so I think that's, yeah. So um, I started a, a TikTok for my brand. Um, and with that, like, I realized that like entrepreneurship can be quite lonely and that we don't get out of our comfort zones a lot of time, like fr for friendships, like we do dating. So that's kind of what you're referring to. Um, so yeah, for sure. I've always been the type of person that like, I will literally send a DM. Like if I go to LA and I follow someone or I think they're inspirational or cool or whatever, like I will literally send the DM and be like, Hey, like, do you want to go for coffee? And it's funny that you say that because when it comes to dating, we would do that. No problem. That would not be weird. But when it comes to friendships, like, I feel like there's like a little bit of a weird connotation behind just like DMing someone and being like, Hi, I want to hang out. But yeah, I've just, I've just been listening to like my gut and I'm like, life is so short, but yeah, like I just say yes to things now. And if I feel like I want to meet someone or hang out with somebody, like, again, the worst thing they can say is no. And something really good can come of it if they say yes. Yeah, for sure. I think usually it, it does end up good. Um, when people are on the same page, right. And you go and meet for a coffee or do something out your comfort zone, you usually finish your end and go, wow, that was really worth doing, uh, on both sides from my experience anyway. Um, Let's jump straight into Miko. Obviously, that's going to be the biggest topic of our conversation. Um, but I guess for people that don't know what Miko Collective is, or they may be hearing about it for the first time, can you share kind of in your own words, your story behind the brand and what it is? Yeah, so um, I launched an activewear brand. You have it in my head now, but like my, my <laughs> you say, you say the quote. That's it works. Um, so. <laughs> um, so I started an activewear brand. Um, we make neutral activewear sets. Um, it's out of Vancouver, BC, so Canada, and solo founded by myself. And um, yeah, we make neutral activewear sets. Um, right now, we are just women's. Um, we have three pieces, three colorways, and more coming on the way. Um, but I actually launched this brand about seven months ago. Um, but like I said, I started thinking about it about two and a half, almost three years ago, I guess now. Um, and when I started, I, I love activewear. I love buying clothes. Obviously, I'm in the fitness industry. And the biggest thing for me was that my body fluctuates a lot. Like, as I've said, you know, it fluctuates. I can get really lean, but I can also gain a little bit, you know, like as a female, you your period, like there's so many different things like hormones, all these things, your body fluctuates. And I noticed that I was either grabbing like, for example, like a seamless set when I felt good, but when I didn't feel good, I would grab like something that didn't look good. And I was like, why do I not have something that I just always feel confident in? Like, I always feel good that I can throw on to go to a workout but also go to coffee after and still look really good. And so I was constantly looking online and I just couldn't find what I wanted. And so I had the inkling and I was like, why don't I just start my own thing? And so I started, honestly, it was, I just started doing research. I started, you know, looking online, like how to start a clothing brand. Like, how do you find a manufacturer? Like all these like little questions. And I just kind of went backwards. Um, so yeah, that's how it kind of evolved. You, you touched on a couple of questions I'm going to follow up with. I guess kind of bringing it back to what sparked the idea. So it sounds like you noticed a gap in the market or a need that wasn't being met. What did you feel like that was? Was it purely because you didn't feel comfortable or you couldn't find something for yourself? Yeah, I just couldn't find it for myself. Um, I, I just, again, like when I was looking, there was no neutral colors. There was no sets. I found that a lot of the pieces that I was already purchasing were like quality was going down. I'd wear them a few times. They'd completely stretch out. And I just realized that I was like, I love this. So I, it really just started with me wanting to make something that I loved and that I wanted to wear. Um, but truly like I want somebody to wear Miko and feel confident in their body in whatever body shape that they have or whatever um, phase they're in, in their life, you know, or, or their body. Cause at the end of the day, like as women, like our bodies fluctuate, 
they naturally do as we age. And you're going to have times where you maybe feel your best and you're going to have times where maybe you, you don't. And so being able to put something on that you truly feel good in is so, so, so important. And I think it's very motivating in your fitness journey too, to put on a set that you are like, I look amazing. Like I feel great. Um, so that's kind of why I started it. And, and, um, we go from X, uh, like extra small to three XL. So it was really important to me to make sure that in like it hugged every single body shape. It wasn't just made for one body type. Awesome. I love that. It's obviously super inclusive and it's going to attract a lot of, a lot of following yeah. as, as it grows now from the ground up, obviously people see online this perfect brand essentially, right? Obviously yeah. that's not always the case. There's the buildup of the business. And I, I want to kind of get an understanding of how you started this. I know you've talked about kind of YouTube videos and, you know, speaking to people. Can you walk yeah. me through kind of what that looked like really from, if you can take yourself back to day one, what yeah. did you even do? Did, was it you in a piece of paper? Was it you and a friend? Like how did, how did that start? Yeah. The whole time it's been just me. And sometimes I, I like, not that I regret that, but I feel like having a co-founder would be so nice just when you have these like low moments. Um, but it was just myself. And honestly, um, I just started looking and being like, what would this look like to start? I started looking at YouTube videos. I started looking at like other brands that were starting. Um, I, I truly like, honestly, it sounds like so makeshift, but I literally went online and was like, how to start a clothing brand. And there was like a list of 20 things. And I just put the list on a piece of paper and like started like checking them off. Like it was super simple. And um, I think one of the biggest things was talking to people. So um, initially I went on like, Alibaba. And I was like, okay, I'm going to get some samples on here. Right. And I got them and they were like so bad. And I was like, okay, like maybe this is not the right way to do it. So I, um, there's a forum called for, uh, forum for women entrepreneurs in Vancouver. And I actually had a, a contact through there. And so I just, again, it's like, shoot your shot. I just sent them an email and said, Hey, like, I want to start an activewear brand. I have no idea what this space looks like. Like I have no background in apparel. I have no background in fashion. Um, so I just said, Hey, like, do you know anyone that works in the space or owns brand in the space? And they sent me, you know, like four different people that they knew. And I actually emailed, um, one of the girls, her name's Karen. She owns a brand called Leslie, the label. And I, she was so sweet and ended up doing a call with me. And she just, I just said, you know, like, what are like three things that you would go back and change? Um, and so she just kind of gave me some like things and I just kind of went from there of like asking people, okay, what would you have done differently? What would you have changed? And there were still so many things that I feel like I did. And I was like, well, I probably shouldn't have done that. But I think you just like learn along the way. And it's it's never going to be perfect in anything that you do. Um, I just want to share one little quote because I know that this is just kind of like in with starting the business. But one of the things that really got me to start was um, I heard this quote called take messy action. And it's so simple, but I think that a lot of times we think that we need to be perfect when we start and we need to like have all the, the steps done and be at our like step a hundred. But at the end of the day, like you're not going to be Lululemon when you start, like you're not going to be one of these massive brands when you start. But I think we think that we need to be like this perfect end point before we start and show everybody. But at the end of the day, if we wait till we get there, we'll never start. So take messy action was just like such a pivotal or like thing that I, I was, I, I think about all the time because when you think about where Lulu or Allo or any of these brands started, like they were probably in someone's house as well, someone's backyard or whatever it looks like or garage, not backyard. Um, so I think I just like started with little things and was like, I'm just going to do it and I'm going to mess up and I'm going to shift and change. I love that you brought up that quote. You beat me to it. It's in my notes here. I was going to ask you, no, it's great because I was going to ask you kind of what your interpretation was that I, I, of that because I heard you say it, but I was curious if how you took that because some people could take that in a certain way. What does that mean when it says take messy, messy action? But I love that quote. I also love that obviously the person you reached out to, they weren't gatekeeping. They essentially said, this is what I've done. These are the mistakes I've made and provided you with information. A lot of people that start businesses, they can be pretty protective of this is what I've built up. This is my baby. When really, if you build that connection, you, it, you know, it's a win-win situation. So I, I, I love that. I kind of want to know if if there was any brands or source of inspiration for you kind of starting or growing in the business. Like, was there anything that drew you towards specific ideas or strategies from them? It can be big corporations or just small businesses that you learn from. Yeah, I think that initially obviously was like big brands. Like someone who really inspired me was like Taylor Chamberlain. She owns a, she's like a, an influencer. She owns a activewear brand as well. Um, 
And I feel like those kinds of people really make you like real, like believe in yourself that you can do it because at the end of the day, she's just like a normal girl who just decided again to take the leap and start a brand. And obviously it's done an amazing job with marketing and stuff like that. Um, but, and then obviously like, of course, Lululemon's amazing. Like I've always loved worn it. Um, it's out of Vancouver as well, which is great. Um, I think I just took like all the brands that I loved and, um, they're like inspiration. And then I kind of just like took little pieces of every piece that I loved. And then I put that into my own. Sweet. I think that's the best idea, right? Is make the, make the perfect dream of what you're looking for. And hopefully that relates to a lot of people. I also saw in your office, I know you've got a new space, you you did meetups of some form at the office. So you became really creative in the way you engage with the community, bring women together. Um, can you share with us kind of how you, you've come up with the different ideas that you've come up with and what inspired you to start hosting events? Yeah, it's actually so funny because when I started my brand, I think that I thought like, obviously I wanted to build community. I think that's something that is so important behind a brand and it's not just a piece of clothing. Do you know what I mean? And I get a lot of fulfillment with talking to people and obviously impacting people in fitness, but also impacting people in, in other ways. Right. And I think it all stemmed from, I mean, I thought that I thought that Mika would be really surrounded around like a fitness community. And that's kind of what I thought initially, which is it's not that it isn't, but it just really shifted. And I think that's like your strategy just kind of evolves. And sometimes you don't realize, like you don't expect the way that it's going to. Um, but it came from, again, like my personal struggle. And so I posted a TikTok saying that I was struggling with loneliness as an entrepreneur. Like I'm a solo founder, you know, I'm sure you feel the same, like here we're sitting in two separate rooms and we're talking now, but like a lot of times, like when you're prepping, you're by yourself, like you're not in this office with a bunch of people. And um, I was working for myself and I just realized like I was feeling so lonely and especially in your fitness journey or entrepreneur journey, once you start to get serious about something, a lot of times your circle gets really small, right? Like you maybe aren't going out as much, like you're getting quite specific on the people that you, you spend your time with. And that means that your circle might get small. Maybe you're not going out on the weekends because you're focused on your business the next day. And so I just felt like I was, I was feeling quite lonely in that sense. So I posted a TikTok saying that I was feeling lonely in entrepreneurship and I had like 200 people message. And so I was like, Hey, like I have a studio, let's do a little like women's meetup in Vancouver. Um, and like 50 girls came and everyone was like, we feel so lonely as well. And I was so shocked because it was literally just a video that I posted. And it was like that account that I posted on is a super small account, but it just really proved that, um, you know, people lack community and, and it was, it was a need. And in that sense, like it's almost been a little bit of marketing for my brand and we're kind of creating this, this community around Miko, but almost on the entrepreneurial side rather than the fitness side, which is something I didn't expect. I love that you, well, you filled the gap essentially, right? There's, there's multiple things. You've got your marketing side, the business, you've got a group of women that you meet. People have reached out to you that you didn't even probably know that were there watching the brand as, as you go. Obviously from those events, it's not like you were looking for results, but obviously it's nice to have them. Was there any kind of things like increased sales or deeper engagement with your audience? I know from these opportunities, you can obviously create meaningful connections with your customers in that sense, but was there anything like that that you noticed from, from doing those events? Yeah, I actually, um, I mean, one of the things was, is obviously like I'm an e-commerce brand, but the one was, or the one comment that I get a lot about my collection is when people come in person, they say, I cannot believe how soft this is. Like, I did not expect this to feel like this. So it was so interesting getting like 50 girls into a space. Like they all came in and now they were all touching, feeling my pieces. Um, and yeah, like I, I think I had maybe like six of them by sets that one day, which is awesome. Um, so yeah, there was, there definitely was sales from that. And then the other thing is again, just like brand awareness. So everyone leaving the events was now mess or now doing a video saying I was just at the founder of Miko collective. And I just, yeah, I didn't really realize that it would kind of turn into that. Um, and that was only one that we did. I'm planning another one now. So this is just really the beginning of it, but yeah, definitely brand awareness and some sales as well. Exciting. Yeah. I think definitely keep them up. It's exciting to see what com comes from them for sure. I want to talk about challenges. Um, I know you probably had many along the way as any small business owner. You just first, you obviously talked about kind of lonely and you posted something about being lonely as a so solo founder. I guess, what do you think now going through it, what can people do to not be as lonely? Obviously you've created events. Is there anything else that you came up with that combated that? Yeah, I think it's just really finding like your core group of friends. And I think that it's, 
I think that you have this struggle, but it's just like staying true to yourself. Um, I think that in the beginning of your fitness, your entrepreneurial journey, I think like I've, I was kind of in this phase of like really being selective with like the friends that I was keeping in my circle that were supportive of me. And so those relationships that I have just like really cultivating and pouring into them has helped me a lot in terms of not feeling lonely and just supported. Um, and then the other thing is obviously just shooting your shot. And if you are feeling that way, like, again, there's so many, like try and find an entrepreneur meetup, try and like message somebody, like really get out of your comfort zone because a lot of us can just like sit in our bubble. But I just think like, again, just get out of your comfort zone and do it just like dating message somebody on Instagram, message another founder. And, um, like I've messaged people that have not, maybe it hasn't turned out as like meeting someone back. And so I just think for myself, like I just really push myself to do things that make me uncomfortable. Like in a couple of weeks, in a week and a half, I'm actually going to LA. My girlfriend, Aisha, she, um, has a podcast as well. It's called coffee and a good vibe. And she's doing an event and I'm super nervous. Like I'm going by myself and like, there's going to be a ton of like influencers and founders, um, there, but I'm like, okay, Shauna, like you need to just put yourself in these like uncomfortable moments because they cause you to grow and you never know like what relationships are going to cultivate out of that. So I think just pushing yourself into like the uncomfortable is really how you get out of that when it comes to like loneliness and creating a circle. What are you doing in LA? Like, what are you like, do you have to speak in front of people? What's no, 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 no. Oh, it's okay. like massive <laughs> founders. Yeah. Okay. Like founder of midday squares, like JS health, like are going to be speaking, which is awesome. Um, I just, I'm going, I just, I'm really just trying to put myself in places that are going to help me grow. If that makes sense. So just being strategic with, like I said, bringing, like, if you can't find that group, um, or like you don't have the circle, maybe that is that pushing you to be the better you or, you know, cultivating like you to push yourself you can create it yourself. Like you're not always in this set point and this goes for anything in life. Like you're, you can always change it. You can always change the trajectory. And so I think like what I did obviously was create a meetup with a lot of, which a lot of people can't do, but even just messaging like one person on social media and being like, Hey, like I'm also a founder. I also am into fitness. Want to go to a workout class. Want to do this. Like nine times out of 10 people will say yes, because at the end of the day, like if you're struggling with loneliness and you're struggling feeling this way, you're not alone in that. Like other people are as well. Did you notice any, I guess, change in your friendship structure when, you know, when you start a business, sometimes you can feel you obviously have the supportive ones, the people that seem supportive, and then they start to drift off. They're all, yeah, you start your brand. And then when it gets down to the hard work, it, it doesn't necessarily come through. Have you, have you experienced anything like that in your, in your friendship group at all? I actually have. Yeah. It's kind of been like, it's honestly been, uh, probably one of the tougher things for me and, I think also just setting boundaries and like knowing in my heart when I have to kind of push people away. And it's been hard because I feel like sometimes those friendships don't really understand why you're maybe pulling back. Um, and yeah, it's, it's just been, it's been a tough one for me for sure, because I internalize a lot of times when like a friend isn't maybe supportive of my brand or supportive of me and what I'm doing. Um, but at the end of the day, like you truly have to, figure out like who makes you feel good. And so something that I've really been focusing on is like when it comes to friendships, like that is a baseline um, that I expectation I have in friendships and relationships is that you support each other in like all the endeavors that you're doing. And if a friendship doesn't support you in your business and like, say, you know, I've planned an event and they just decide to cancel last minute, like that's not a supportive friend. And that's not somebody who like, I want to bring along the way with me. And so it's been really hard for me because I feel like I've had to like really set some boundaries that maybe I haven't in the past. But when you know, like I said, like you have to really hone in on those friends that like really do. And so um, I think that social media gives you this also like unrealistic, maybe expectation of how many, this huge friend group that you're going to have. And I think like I just turned 30 and I think that as you get into your thirties, like you realize, okay, like I'm not going to have 20 friends that are going to be hanging out with me and be by my side the whole time. Right. And so just really, really like being grateful of those three or four or five that you have and like putting all your energy back into them, um, rather than wanting that big group, um, has been really like what I've been trying to do to cope with, you know, the ones that maybe kind of aren't supportive in that. Yeah. I mean, you've got to protect your circle and that can be very challenging because as a brand, you're trying to build that community. You want as many people involved as possible. 
but you close the circle you have to protect so that your business thrives. Um, you've talked about kind of obviously building this business and putting your life savings into it, essentially, um, whatever that may look like. But I want to understand what's kind of been your relationship with the feeling of risk. Because obviously there's been risk. That's a challenge that you deal with, uh, whether it's money or other risk that we've taken. What's been your relationship with risk? Yeah, I feel like I've always been a person that's like ready to dive into the deep end. Um, it's not something that I feel like I had like growing up. Um, like even when I started this business, like, you know, my parents were like, are you kidding me? Like you're going to put X amount, like you're going to risk losing that. And I just, I just think again, like, what I went through really allowed me to be like, okay, even like, I always put myself in like worst case scenario. That's what I, when I go to do something, I think what's the worst case scenario. So with this, for example, like with risk in this situation, I said, okay, like maybe I spend $50,000 to start this business and I lose it all. I literally lose it all. It's so interesting how we have this like negative connotation with starting our own business and losing $50,000. But even if I lose it, I learn so much, right? But mm -hmm. if we went to university and we spent $50,000 on university, that would be a good investment, but it's not a guarantee either. Do you know what I mean? So yeah, no, I just always it. think of like worst case scenario is okay, I lose it all. And then like, I go get a serving job and I restart, like, you know what I mean? Um, like, I just always think like, I'm going to be fine. I'm going to figure it out. And I think that like, I don't know, the world is kind of about the energy that you put in and it's always going to gonna come back in, in a way, shape or form, whether it's like you learn something, you start something else. I think like I was listening to a podcast about the owner of Gymshark. And I think that I've listened to a ton of podcasts, which are really helpful um, of like founders that, you know, like sometimes I'm like, I'm failing and I'm so hard on myself. And then I listened to this podcast about this brand that I thought just blew up this year. And they're like, no, we started 12 years ago. And like our first round of investors, we told them like, we're done. But you don't hear yeah. about those like stories, if that makes sense. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, I like so... Jim, Jim Sarks, because they live two hours from my house in England. Yeah, so that was like growing up, like when it was 12 years ago now, that was, it went crazy over there. And all it was, it, they just had this, essentially a cartoon shark on their shirts. It was nothing. And they were just printing it in the garage. And obviously now it's what, a billion, billion dollar business and it, and it grew. And obviously they went through the pains that you are now. Everyone starts from somewhere and that story is obviously inspiring, but it's, uh, yeah, definitely an interesting topic. Well, he also had like seven businesses before then, which I had no idea. I was listening to it on a podcast. And so I think that when we think that like we have this, again, perfectionism mindset, but it's like he, like his next reaction is like he fit maybe failed on five, six businesses before, but then the seventh one was a bang, but you only hear about the seventh one. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. So yeah. I think that I just really try to remind myself that like, regardless of what happens, like I'm going to be fine and I've been in the lowest lows. So like, just go for it. Yeah, for sure. In it's early days, right? You, is it seven months in? Um, that's, that's still really young, right? So it's, it's only onwards and upwards from there. Um, you did share a video. I actually saw it. I think it was TikTok again. Um, that seems to be where I see everything going on. But it was you were clearly upset. You were having a tough moment. Um, you shared it, and then I think you paused and you kind of went into talking talking about kind of what that experience was like. Can you share kind of moments that you have that have caused you to kind of get into that situation? Because again, there might be a lot. But is there anything that sticks out that that really was a challenge that you had to overcome? Yeah. So I'm gonna try and like say that. So I'll, 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 I'll say the whole situation. So when I started my brand, um, obviously like I had no fund for like models and all of these things, right? Like, I think that you mentioned that sometimes from the outside, your brand looks like a lot more established than it actually is. And I think that's kind of where I'm at right now, which is obviously a great problem to have. It's great that people are looking out from the outside and saying, Oh my goodness, this brand's doing amazing X, Y, Z. Um, but what had happened was, you know, I got a little bit of feedback or I started getting feedback on TikTok about um, sizing of models and that I didn't have, you know, the, any plus size models on my site and I needed more inclusivity on my site in terms of sizing, in terms of models. And I had a conversation with someone and it just made me really upset because I feel like I'm truly trying so hard to do all the things. And when people look at my brand from the outside, I'm sure that it looks like it's bigger than it is. But at the end of the day, it's just myself. Like I'm doing the emails, I'm doing the customer service, I'm packing every single order. 
it's it was in my bedroom up until like two weeks ago, and I just put in my storage locker all my inventory. Um, I just got a studio recently, but that was again like a risk that I took. I don't have anyone helping me. Um, all the models that I got initially on the site were literally my like my best friends that were like, we are happy to help you, but it wasn't um, finding people. And a lot of the even like creators on my on my page. Um, are even friends of mine that I've had to, you know, ask because when it comes to marketing and, and influence the influencer world, you have to pay influencers to, to post your product essentially. Right. And I have zero budget for that right now. I'm still in the really early stages. Um, and so it just made me really sad because my goal for this brand was to obviously, or is to be an ex- inclusive brand. And I go up to three XL for, for a reason. I want everybody type to, to feel confident. But when I hit that moment where um, people had started kind of commenting on like the models on my site. Um, it just made me really sad because it was things that like now I'm dealing with that maybe like are seen on the outside, but I'm here trying my absolute best. Um, and obviously everything is amazing feedback. And now we just have to go back and kind of shift and change. Um, but I think when it comes to small brands, like a lot of times people have these expectations, like they would on these billion dollar brands that they're paying like thousands and thousands and thousands of dollars on these shoots and models and paying the specific model that they want. Um, but finding creators and finding people that will do things for, I mean, essentially free isn't, isn't easy. And so it's something that I'm trying to learn and do and find. Um, but when you don't have a budget for that and you're a small brand that's in your bedroom, um, it's just like, it's hard to get that feedback sometimes. Obviously you've kind of, I guess, come from the influencer side and then you pinned the business hat on. Has the challenge just been, obviously the budget is what it is, right? Especially as a small business. Has that just been essentially building up relationships to see if you can get people to connect with you that will be able to do things? Because obviously you, you really are just trying to work things out day by day, right? And what a lot of people don't see. To be honest, I think you do a good job. Again, I've kind of seen the brand and you are super relatable. And I think that's the biggest attraction to a brand before you even look at the product. Again, the product's not for me. I'm not a woman. It's yeah. not something that I'll be wearing. But <laughs> you can wear it, the leggings. I'm I mean, the honestly, sure. Maybe at home, but um, that's important, right? And I think people that can relate with you understand that, you know, as a small business, or if you've not run a business, that's hard to understand. But because of the videos you're putting out, I genuinely believe that's a massive benefit that you have for your business because people are seeing kind of the journey where you're currently at, what it's taking and behind the scenes you do, you're doing all that work. Um, I even saw you, I, I believe you like delivered things in Vancouver yourself. I saw you walking across Vancouver because you wanted them to get them st- the same day. But that is something that, that stands out to customers, right? You, you did that to make sure they get it the same day. You're trying your hardest. So those one or a couple of comments that are coming through, it, it's hard to ignore, but um, you have to try your best to do that, right? Yeah, for sure. And they're things that I'm just learning. Again, they're just like all first times for me. Like everything's a first time. So um, I think that's the thing is like just knowing that like these and again, getting like feedback, it's a good problem to have because it just means that your brand is being seen. Um, but I just sometimes I'm like, I'm doing my best, like I'm trying. Um, but yeah, it's 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 again just a big learning curve and and that's okay. Well, you do you're doing a good job, and especially on social media. <laughs> I think that's honestly a great Thank thing. You. I wanted to talk about social media because not only in the world we live in, but also business. What what role do you feel social media plays kind of in your branding, but also the messaging that you're trying to convey to, to people? Yeah. Um, I think it's like, there's two different ones because I think that obviously like my health coaching business, it's so funny because I have two very different, um, very different pages. And so with like my fitness page, it's very me and my body. And that's kind of like, what that that branding is which is obviously great but I think it comes in like into play with what I struggle with a little bit and we kind of touched on this a little bit and I said how I liked coming on the podcast because it's nice to talk and it doesn't just it's really getting to know you rather than just like my fitness business and my body um so I think in like terms of that it it, it's it can be tough um and especially in my in my activewear brand as well social media is amazing because it has allowed me to create this brand and to be able to be seen and create a community anywhere in the world. Um, but again, it's, it's hard to navigate sometimes because I think on like Instagram side of things, like you want things to look really like curated, et cetera. And TikTok, I really had to take like a totally different, um, spin on it. Like initially I started showing the product, but what's really been 
the kind of driver is me just actually posting a video talking about struggles. So I think social media, it, it's great because it kind of allows me to have both sides of things and like show the brand, but also show my personal story. Do you feel pressure with social media at all? Whether that's in, I, do. I know you've got kind of two versions of it, obviously your, your personal body brand or whatever you want to call it in that sense. But do you feel pressure when it comes to social media? Yeah, a ton, a ton of pressure. Um, I feel, yeah, I do. Like, it's so interesting. I just wonder what it would be like to go a day, one, like, I don't know, go on a vacation and just like not have to take videos of like what you're eating, your body. And um, I think it's something that really, and I know it's going back to like my fitness coaching and personal, but I think that social media has an insane play on how I feel about like my body and myself because I was talking to a friend about this the other day and it was so interesting because it's like, you can feel so confident in yourself in person. And then you go on social media and you go to like, take a video of yourself or whatever. And then you start like critiquing little things about yourself that like you never thought in person. Um, so a hundred percent, I feel like there's a massive pressure with social media. Um, and it's so distracting as well. Just like constantly being on it. You're constantly seeing what everyone's doing. And for my brand as well, it's like comparison, right? Um, I think comparing yourself to other brands and other people and what they're doing, um, it can like really suck you in when you have a brand, because again, there's no right, right, right way to do anything, but sometimes you just naturally are going to start looking what other brands are doing and what's right or wrong. And I think I struggled with that initially when it came to like my TikTok for Miko, because I thought that I had to have this like perfected feed on TikTok because that's what like the big brands looked like, you know, but then I realized, okay, like there's no rules. There's literally no rules. So now I just like post a video of me talking. And sometimes I'm like, this doesn't look very good. Like for owning a brand, like for, for, like for a brand, like this doesn't look very good, but I think it's just like taking off the, like what's right and wrong. And there is no rules now. Yeah, exactly. I mean, look at Alex Earl. I think she's, she's the one that's blown up right now. We've all seen her bedroom, but we'll skip that one. Obviously these, there's been challenges, um, but there's also been a lot of uh, highs as well. Um, I saw you recently announced, you know, you're going into a, be featured in, in a workout studio, I believe. Yes, um, so yeah. obviously, you know, finding that out, I guess, how did that feel um, about that opportunity? Um, did that kind of mark a pivotal expansion in the brand for you? Yeah, I think it's awesome because um, initially I really wanted to keep things e-commerce and just like in my own, but um, obviously it's really good for, um, brand awareness. And it was actually, I haven't actually announced who it is yet, but it's another female entrepreneur in Vancouver. And I think it's awesome just to like work with other female entrepreneurs and like be, um, helping each other, if that makes sense. So it was just like a really, really aligned, um, studio because again, she just really has like all the same values as me. And also in that, like, you know, I think the relationship actually really cultivated, um, because we both were talking about like the things we were struggling with and we honestly just went for coffee. Like it was literally social media coffee and started talking and really just aligned that way. And I think we both just really want like each other's brands to succeed. And so to be able to like help each other with that, um, was awesome. And, um, yeah, it's going to be really exciting to have it so that like other people can actually see the product in person. Awesome. Yeah. Looking forward to, to that getting announced. I want to kind of understand before we go on to mental health, what kind of exciting plans, aspirations or collections, collaborations, what have you got to look forward to? I know you might not want to throw a spoiler out there, but what's that looking like for obviously a bit of growth here? Yeah. So I want to create another collection. Um, we're just kind of working on that right now in terms of um, selling inventory that I have, getting new collections, um, just completing like pieces. The biggest thing with my collection was that I really wanted it to be versatile and be able to like keep in the color schemes and then you be able to exactly like wear it from sweat to street like out. So I wanted every piece, I want the new pieces to kind of like complement and add on to the pieces that we currently have. Um, and then in terms of collaborations, kind of working with maybe a few creators on some uh, like collaboration collections in the next year is kind of what's on the trajectory. Exciting. You look excited. Yeah, I'm really excited. It's it's Good. exciting. It's again, like they're all just like little risks again. I feel like every time it's like you just like push, like, you know, it's like mm -hmm. you think that when you start the business, it's like going to be like, okay, smooth sailing. But it, I feel like every chapter you go into, you still have to like push yourself off the, off the ledge a little bit, you know? Yeah. You have to build it up over time. Right. And that's, it's clearly growing, right? People are seeing it. People are aware of it. So that's the, you know, that's the reward that you'll get in, in turn. 
Um, let's talk about mental health a little bit. Just a, just a short topic. I know we kind of talk about it along along the way here, but there's a couple of things I want to talk about. I'm going to dive straight into this one um, with regards to your childhood and kind of your, your family relationship with your father. What did that kind of do with your mental health? If you want to just kind of share that story a little bit, um, kind of how did that affect your life when you were younger and how has it played into your adult life? Yeah. Um, it's so funny because growing up, like my dad was always super supportive and, um, in terms of like athletics, but I just realized that, you know, like, um, he had, he dealt with a lot of like alcoholism and, um, my whole childhood. And I don't think I really realized how much it affected me, honestly, like at all until I started getting into relationships. And it's honestly really been the last couple of years that I've really realized like how much my childhood affected me in terms of like the love that I was given and now how I try and, or I mean, I've done a ton of work now, but in the last couple of years, and even after my ex, just like realizing how much, um, you know, the, like how I didn't get the, the validation from my dad and how, um, like almost like the abandonment from alcoholism, um, caused me to like try and find my worth in others, um, almost because I didn't get that from my dad. And so it's been something that I'm still dealing with. I have therapy session tomorrow. Um, and it just like, yeah, I think that it, it, it's come up a lot in relationships recently or in, in the last couple of years, just in terms of, me trying to chase that validation and like prove that I can make people love me, if that makes sense. And I know that goes super deep, but I think that we don't really realize a lot of times and we don't give ourselves like enough grace for like why we maybe choose the relationships that we go into or how we react to situations. And I think that doing a lot of reflection, like just it gives yourself like a little bit more grace of like how you grew up and how that affects you now and having that self-awareness and being able to like take little steps to like work on that. Yeah. I think self-awareness is key. I mean, I, I never met my thought, my father. So that was, no, that was just an experience through childhood that I, I knew nothing different. And if everyone listens to episode one, they'll be able to hear kind of the full story there, but you go through that and you don't realize that it does affect you when you're older. And then that's when the self-awareness comes in. You, that can be in relationships, abandonment, self-love and, and what that looks like. And, and really this conversation, you've, you've turned it around in that sense. You've got to look at it as in the positive light. Look at the two businesses you're running. They're very positive. You're helping other people as, as well. So thanks for sharing that. I want to come back onto social media and kind of mental health because I know people challenge, have challenges with kind of comments. How have you dealt with social media. I know obviously you've got your personal account. A lot of it's to do with your body or self image. What have you, what have you dealt with when it comes to kind of social media and challenges? If I'm being honest, like I'm extremely lucky. Like I feel like I don't get nasty, nasty DMS like, or anything like that. I think TikTok's been the one spot where I've gotten a lot of like negative comments, especially it's actually really interesting though, because I did like where I kind of blew up on TikTok was my before and after videos um, mm -hmm. when I had my transformation of like 25 pounds. But it's actually interesting because people were mainly talking about like that I should go back to where I was at. So I feel like it didn't bother me because like in my heart, I knew that I was doing it for myself and I got, I looked the way I do or whatever, but I feel like the negative comments, I don't know. I, I just, I don't really let them get to me, to be honest. Um, I think when it comes to my brand, that gets to me way more, which is really interesting how I put my worth in my brand more than when someone comments on my actual physical self. Like, it doesn't bother me as much. But I think I just try and, like, put into perspective, especially with with my fitness coaching and, like, social media there. I just am, like, keep talking because you're just, like, driving the engagement. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Um, but when it comes to social media and um, – and that I just try and like, try and not listen to that because at the end of the day, like nobody that's secure in themselves is going to ever comment something negative about you on, um, their page. But, uh, social media is a hard, a hard one. And it's not, again, it's not a linear thing. And I think taking social media breaks and not following the people that don't make you feel good about yourself, um, is super important. Um, and again, just sort of reminding yourself that like you are you and like not to compare yourself ever to anyone else, because like, again, they're a step a hundred you might be on step five, like everybody's lives and situations and are different. So I just really, really, really try my hard not to compare myself there. 
Well, you look, you're lucky if you've not had that challenge. You know, I've, I've spoken to some people that have had it quite bad and social media is, you know, it's, it's a beast, right? It's everyone has access to put a comment on there. And even with brands, you know, you kind of, I don't know if you're putting your identity behind your brand, but you've got to be careful that you don't because that can make you upset, right? When comments come through and you realize how much you're putting into it, you don't want that to affect your mental health. So um, you got to be careful with that one. To kind of wrap up here, a question I ask everyone, um, if you could title this particular chapter in your life, what would you name it and why? Oh my goodness. Um, it's not an easy one. I always ask. I don't know. I feel like growth just like came to my mind um, because I'm in like a major learning stage. Um, but I also feel like like security is a really good one or like in terms of words because I just feel like um, I've done a ton of work and like things are just kind of like flowing together and I don't know. Yeah. Like abundance, security, growth. Those are all kind of like words that are coming to my mind about this next, this chapter. Amazing. Well, finally for, for the listeners that have obviously listened, where can they find Miko Collective online and, and also follow yourself? Yeah. So Miko Collective is like MYKO Collective and it's on Instagram and TikTok and then obviously MikoCollective.com. And then my name is Shauna Jens Fitness on TikTok and Instagram. Awesome. Thanks for joining me, Shauna. Of course. Thank you for having me.